When we left off last week, we were in the middle of the transfer pricing uh, section. And we had gotten through what uh, I think I referred to as, let's say, basic uh, concepts. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, transfer pricing methods. Uh, we're not going to talk very much about it because if we talked in any amount of detail, I think we would uh, take far too much time. Uh, and this is something that I uh, certainly would like you to take a look at uh, personally in terms of just seeing uh, in brief uh, what these are as they're described in the, uh, uh, in the regulations. Now, one of the aspects of, uh, of transfer pricing is which method should you use? Uh, a few years ago, before the current regulations were put into place, uh, there was a priority rule. In other words, you had to use a comparable, uncontrolled price if you could find one. You had to. If you couldn't, then you went to the next method, which was called the resale method. If you couldn't use that, then you had to go to a third method, which was cost plus. And if you couldn't use that, then you had to use your imagination and creativity and come up with something that made sense for your circumstances. Now it is no longer that way. We have a number of additional uh, additional methods uh, in addition to those three. And we have a principle that says there is no priority. You analyze your situation and come up with the best method that fits your situation. The one that will give you the economically most correct price. This is the, the basic concept and there's quite a, uh, quite a bit of uh, detail in terms of examples of this uh, that you'll find in the regulations. So uh, if this is an area you want to get into in significant detail, those would be something to read. Uh, that's in the, uh, the Dash 8 uh, regulation. Again, from the standpoint of not going into too much uh, detail, what I would like to do is uh, just, in a sense, point out how different methods are allowed, so to speak, for different kinds of income. Now, of course, it makes sense economically that certain uh, methods are allowed for certain types of income because, for example, you don't have a normally a resale in the context of pricing a service. So uh, later when we see a slide that you know, says the uh, uh, services, uh, we'll see a different listing of, uh, of methods. Notice... Uh, you'll notice that pretty much for uh, every, uh, uh, every type, uh, as we go through the slides, you'll find something regarding controllable, uncontrolled price, or as uh, Ben was saying with regard to uh, intangibles, uh, uh, comparable, uncontrolled transaction method, which he abbreviated as CUT, C-U-T. So you often hear, uh, if you get into transfer pricing, the uh, abbreviation CUP method for, uh, for the method as it applies to transfers of tangible personal property. To mention uh, a little something about uh, this particular area where we're talking about primarily sales of inventory or sales of fixed assets that are not inventory. Uh, any uh, transfer of any asset can be covered by these uh, methods. And your comparable uncontrolled price method, again, economically, can you find another transaction where the same product uh, is, that is sufficiently comparable to, uh, to your product transaction your controlled sale 
Can you find an uncontrolled one somewhere that's close enough where you can say, okay, I should use the same price? Or where it's close, but there's identifiable differences that you can come up with some quantification for each difference. So that again, you can, by interpolation, come up with a price for your controlled transaction. That's essentially what comparable and controlled means. And you will remember from last week where we talked quite a bit about what comparability means. We talked about functions, we talked about risks, we talked about contract terms, economics. As uh, I think we tried to point out last time, while this is an area where we deal with numbers and you, you think, gee, this should be relatively uh, black and white and uh, coming up with things, it's an objective process. No, it really isn't. It's very, very subjective as to what is or what is not comparable. Uh, yes? Uh, I had a question about that because we're in a time where there's not really something comparable, I mean, economically. How do we look at how the economy rises and falls? I mean, we have to go back to, I guess, the 80s? Or, or do not make that retroactive? perspective. Well, let's uh, I, let's say that you have a situation where okay, you're you have a transaction today and let's assume all other things are the same in terms of the product being sold, the uh, conditions uh, that it's being sold under and so on, except that it was sold uh, 30 years earlier. Now, you have to make this subjective judgment is, is the time a factor. Can you adjust for inflation that has occurred between the two periods? Were economic conditions sufficiently similar or not similar back then to allow you to, uh, to consider this uh, comparable? I would say it would be a very unusual situation where 30 years has elapsed and you conclude that it really is comparable. But again, uh, that could be, uh, uh, you might have a situation where that in fact uh, happens. Uh, yes? Uh, um, just to kind of take a step back for a second, in terms of actual practice, an attorney, it seems like all you would do is say, we have a transfer pricing issue, call in the economist. Like, that, is that right? I mean, is that... Actually, actually, that is not far off. <laughs> that is not far off. And then... Absolutely. And then just really quickly, is it also the job of attorneys then to evaluate to some extent that the economists have satisfied the elements of what the regulations set forth. I mean, is that also a piece of the work that they would do? Or? We'll get into this a bit more in some later slides, but uh, I think the point is that in your place as an attorney involved on your client, that number one, you have to be alert to economic situations where the pricing might innately have a problem and create risks for your client that cause you to say, hey, we do need to call in the, econ the economists to do a study on this area because it's high risk. Now, uh, once the economists are brought in, yes, you're part of the team in a sense which makes sure that what they're looking at uh, are the right things. Because if you're doing your job right, you know your client's business. And you should be, in a sense, helping the economists plan what they're going to do and make sure that they've done it and that they've applied the law correctly. Uh, generally, the economists who work in this area are specialized in this area, and this is all they do. Or this is this just isn't a sidelight uh, for them. Uh, 
where they occasionally do a transfer pricing project. So you're part of the team, but more importantly, and again, I'll get into this a little more uh, on a later slide, you're the one who's out there and you have to, in a sense, look for where the risk areas are and attempt to help your client manage that risk. Uh, in real life, the comparable uncontrolled price method, although it might be termed the gold standard of, uh, of pricing, uh, isn't actually used very often because it's so seldom that there really is an exact comparable. So what happens? Well, uh, some other method ends up getting used. If we have a situation where there's let's say a manufacturer and a distributor in the group, then one approach in a sense is to look at that distributor and use what's called the resale method, which lends itself to uh, distribution type situations where a product is purchased and resold. And why, do, why is that a relatively practical method? <coughs> because there's a lot of databases which show for various uh, distributors in different industries what margins they're making. So it, it's possible to find not necessarily an exact comparable product, but you can learn roughly what profitability, what operating income, uh, a uh, a distributor has in a particular industry. And that can create a range, in other words, by looking at five or 10 or 20 different distributors, you end up getting a range of margins which you then apply to your controlled situation. The cost plus, on the other hand, does not lend itself to a distributor situation. Cost plus implies, well, you're performing a service for me and you know I'm giving you all you need in terms of knowledge I'm the one taking real business risk on this thing you're just performing a service to my specifications cost plus will very often be used there and contract manufacturing is the most typical example of that uh, comparable profits method uh, there, maybe you have two or three or more companies that are all, uh, all related, and they're all contributing to some sort of a transaction. Uh, let's, for simplicity, say there's two, two companies. You look at each company and you say, which one has the more, uh, let's say, mundane business? Which is the one that has more routine activities? Because routine activities, in a sense, can be valued. If activities are not routine, if they're special for some reason, or they involve important intangibles, then that, of course, makes it very hard to value. So if you can find one company which in a sense, is only performing routine functions, mundane functions. You can come up with probably a pretty good value for what those mundane functions uh, are, and then use that for this, what's referred to as the tested party. And then uh, once you have that number, you know what the number is for the, uh, for the other related party. And then the last one, uh, profit, or the uh, second to the last one, profit split method, attempts to, again, calculate for the various transactions that are being looked at, a combined profit, and then come up with some logical method which takes into account the relative uh, functions and values and uh, assets and risks that each party is, uh, is uh, conducting try to come up with some sort of a split. Maybe, gee, the value this one has is 45% and the value this one is bringing to the table is 55, so we're going to split the profit on that basis. Those are, in a nutshell, the, the principal methods. The unspecified method uh, is 
well, gee, if you can find something that makes even more sense than any of these, uh, and you can convince the IRS of it, use it. Now, notice uh, the top part is transfer of tangible property. The bottom is use of tangible property. And the regulations there really only speak about a comparable uncontrolled rental. In a rental situation, I think it's probably a little bit easier to come up with some sort of logic, whether it's that you actually find another rental of the same property between unrelated parties, or you come up with what, uh, in a sense, return on investment a lessor might have for property of that category. Uh, the next area, transfer of intangible <coughs> property. Now, uh, this is kind of interesting structurally because you're, of course, taught uh, from other aspects that it's very important to know whether you have a sale of an intangible or whether you have a license of an intangible. It can make a big difference whether you have capital gain or ordinary income. It can make a big difference uh, uh, in terms of sourcing of income. But here, for transfer pricing purposes, they're lumped together recognizing that whether you know, all rights are transferred or whether it's only certain rights for a limited period, we're looking at the same question of value of an intangible. So the rules do not distinguish between sale and license. We have the same choices and the same application for uh, both types of transactions. Now note the bottom point about the commensurate with income concept. Uh, Congress uh, some years ago was concerned of course, they're still concerned, but that's another issue, uh, was concerned with the fact that if you sold an intangible, you had to come up with a price today for the date of transfer. And once that price was determined, that's the price you live with. And if it turns out that this intangible is on the one hand, uh, it turns out to be really worthless in the future. The, uh, the uh, transferee really is not able to use it uh, to gain any profit. Well, uh, that's the transferee's tough luck. On the other hand, of course, if this is what Congress was more concerned about, if this uh, formula, for example, for a drug turned, up, turned out to be uh, the only uh, cure for cancer, then the transferor would be recognizing, you know, uh, the uh, value at that date of transfer, which doesn't reflect the fact that this becomes so important later because of events that happen later in terms of how the uh, product is marketed, its uh, efficacy, its uh, you know, all of these factors which come out later after the transfer. So Congress said there's something wrong with producing intangible property here in the United States, selling it for what's arguably an arm's length amount, but it turns out to be so extremely valuable, all that excess profit is earned overseas in the subsidiary that that, uh, let's say, the parent has sold the, uh, the formula for this drug item to. So they said, even though you sell it today, even though you enter into a license agreement, which is arm's length today, there must be adjustments later if that property turns out to be so valuable that it really should have been sold at a higher price. It should have been licensed for a higher royalty percentage. So this is what the comparable 
uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, commensurate with income concept is. And later when we talk about 367D, which was mentioned uh, uh, this morning about tax-free transfers of property, in this case specifically intangibles, that would otherwise be tax-free, but except for this uh, 367D rule. We'll see that that also has a commensurate with income concept in it, so that, again, the U.S. transferor is made to recognize income that takes into account future events not known at the time of the transfer. So that concept, both 482 and 367, taking into account events after the transfer. Okay, there's quite a list of uh, items for services. Uh, probably the, uh, the only one that really merits uh, a word or two is the service cost method. And essentially what that's saying is that in the case of certain normal routine activities, the transfer price can be equal to the cost of the activities without any profit markup. And there's a, I think, a revenue procedure which lists out many, many, many uh, activities which arguably come within this. So, for example, if you're working within the uh, in-house legal counsel, uh, uh, the in-house counsel section of a company, your costs, uh, because of the work you're doing that benefits a subsidiary, for example, uh, only your costs would need to be charged to that subsidiary. There doesn't need to be a markup on those costs, despite how valuable your advice might be. Does that make you feel bad, Jessica, that you're not being valued sufficiently? So long as I get paid a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, I see. Okay, very good. What are you laughing about? You don't think she's going to be worth that much? Okay, uh, anyway, uh, moving uh, swiftly onward. Loans and advances. Uh, there are, of course, a couple of methods. Uh, one which is, you know, arm's length, uh, determine what unrelated lenders and borrowers under the same conditions would charge in terms of interest. As an alternative, if you're talking about US dollar uh, loans or advances, there's uh, specifically uh, an applicable federal rate safe haven methodology. And every month, the IRS publishes in a revenue ruling the short-term, mid-term, long-term uh, rates, uh, AFR rates, uh, for these, uh, these types of transactions. Uh, before we go on to the next section, uh, any uh, questions about the pricing methods as opposed to uh, uh, other aspects? Uh, yes, Jessica. So if you're doing a comparable pricing method, if you're comparing to an, a sale to not a another controlled entity, an uncon if you're looking at an uncontrolled yeah. transaction, yeah. do you get to do a markdown for the synergies because your companies are related, or no? Well, actually, you're you're getting to a very interesting aspect, which uh, I think we can talk about in theory but really isn't there in the regulations. And that is, if we look at two unrelated companies, okay, they're going to negotiate and bargain and come to whatever the price is, and each one will make whatever it makes. But you take a multinational in today's environment that is manufacturing in maybe five different countries, uh, several of which are in Asia and have very low, uh, low uh, labor rates, has uh, R&D functions uh, in the United States and maybe in some other locations as well, 
uh, has sales and distribution and logistics functions at various places. In other words, a very integrated operation. One of the things that adds to their bigness is the fact that they do have some economic economies of scale. There's some sort of intangible of just being large and having all these resources. And yes, if you add up all of the, uh, the amounts that are earned in total, yeah, it might be more than just what the unrelated buyer and seller earn if you combine their operations. So yeah, theoretically, there's a factor there. And except maybe in the profit split method, this doesn't get accounted for. So yeah, it's it's a very you know interesting area that, in theory, there's some value, but uh, it's really not uh, taken into account.